Well, hello there, Vince. Well, hello how, there, Brian. How are you? I'm fantastic. You're, how you're are ready you? to talk some football, man? I'm uh-huh. doing great. Favorite show of the week. I've been watching film all night of a four all day of a 44 to nothing beatdown. Fun film to Notre watch. Notre Dame over Boston College. Fredo. You know what yesterday was? Fredo. It, yesterday was the scene and Godfather 2 where Fredo gets taken out into the lake. That's what yesterday was. <laughs> so <laughs> It was um, incredibly dominating performance by Notre Dame in in every area. Mm -hmm. Today in this show, we are going to kind of talk about what we felt about this game after we had a chance to watch some film. So we really dive into it. And, you know, Vince, we just kind of spent a little bit of time game planning a little bit on this one and definitely some interesting takes, I thought. You know, there are some areas where I thought Notre Dame was a little better even than I thought. Uh, especially game plan wise. And, yeah. and, you know, we had a chance to watch the offensive line a little bit more specifically and holy moly, the interior of the offensive line. Wow. Mm-hmm. We'll get into that a little bit. Defensively, we watched uh, more. We'll have, we'll talk about kind of what we saw schematically that worked. some things that like, Oh, if this team had better players, maybe this might've been a little bit different, at least as far as it would have been zero points. Right. But then also why, you know, some things they did that worked. And then of course we'll, we'll talk a little bit at the end. Because we got a little bit of a glimpse into the future at yeah. the end of this game as well, which which, uh, which was fun defensively, so, anyway. Yes, yes, exactly. So that's uh, that's our plan for tonight, Vince. So of course, this is our upon further review show. We will we will break down things. If you have a super chat, we will answer it at the end. Otherwise, it's just focusing on this show. And my dad's in the chat. He said it's Southern Cow Week, and <laughs> it's not quite there yet. Yes, we have to do this it's show not first. Quite there yet. Uh, right. I, I, as I told somebody I was just talking to before the show, I'll, I trust me, I know what I'm doing after the show is over and it's diving into USC <laughs> well, film. There's no doubt about that. This is the last time I'm going to mention Southern Cal in this in this particular episode. But well, actually, it's no, not. it's not. But there is one say, other actually, time. Actually, it's, it's not relevant I, to the Boston College. film. Correct. Right. Uh, but watching that USC UCLA game last night and I watched it start to finish. I'm very excited to play USC. Yeah, that, that's what I got yep. out of that game. So right. kind of excited about that. But it's going to have to be about building on what you we bet. saw from Notre Dame. And that's going to be a key in this game, Vince. And as we always do, because I'm an offensive coach, you were an offensive coach. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about we're going to talk about uh, the offense first. And so, Vince, there was a lot to like about the game. Yeah. I feel like the snowstorm in the second half and allowed Notre Dame to, or allowed Boston College to, number one, milk the clock a little bit. Notre Dame's defense wasn't heating BC up as much mm-hmm. in the third quarter. So Notre Dame had one full possession in the third quarter, and it was a touchdown. And they had, I think, it ran two plays on their next possession and then went into the fourth quarter, and that drive stopped at the seven yard line. And they only had one other possession right. after that. They only they had three from. possessions the whole second half, I believe. Yeah. If I remember correctly, I believe they only had three possessions the second half. So obviously, I you know I, I felt like the snow, uh, the weather uh, conditions to me kind of kept Notre Dame from pouring on even more. Yeah. But I, I felt like it was a complete game. You know, that's that's mm-hmm. the thing. I felt like it was a complete game. I felt like offensively, defensively, this was a four quarter game where the focus is there, the intensity was there, the execution was there you know, for the most part, and they really put a bad team away. And they did what a top 10 team is supposed to do to a team like Boston College. Correct. That's what I felt about this game. Yep. Offensively, Vince, I'm going to talk about run game first. We've talked kind of big picture on Saturday night after the game. We're going to talk specifically about the run game and the pass game and how they worked. I will say this. People, somebody earlier, so I think Karen said, uh, or no, I think it was Michael Johnson might have said that this was Notre Dame's first complete game. And I think in some areas you could say that because I felt like the the only complete game before this was Clemson. I Clemson. thought the Notre Dame beat Clemson for yeah. four quarters. But mm-hmm. if I'm going to try to read Michael's mind a little bit, I'm going to say that was a complete game as far as dominance beginning to end. But your pass game was almost non-existent in that game. Right. And you right? can blame so, the wind. And I mean, there's things that you can blame, right. obviously. Right. But in this game, we yeah. at least saw all aspects of the team making yeah. an impact. And the pass game didn't really impact that game as much. I mean, you had a couple screens, Chris Tyree, you had the late throw to Michael Mayer, but that kind of put the game away. It wasn't like it got you there. I thought this was the best complimentary football we've seen Notre Dame play. 
uh, for, for 60 minutes outside of, you know, I think the only other game where the offense could say that was against North Carolina. I thought that was the only other game we saw anything like this. And it was a good sign. And there was even some missed opportunities that you may say, hey, look, if the wind wasn't or the weather wasn't the way it was, which forces the quarterback to put a glove on or, you know, a couple <laughs> things like that, maybe things turn out a little bit different. Sure. But I think, first of all, Vince, let's talk about the Notre Dame run game. I will contend that this was this was Tommy Reese's best game plan, and in my opinion, and, and even better than Clemson, because again he was able to do more throwing the football this game because the win wasn't nearly as bad in this game as it was against Clemson, and the the I mean the cold it's cold but you can cold. still throw the football right, and I'm going to give you a couple reasons why at the very least it was on par with Clemson. And the reason why I liked it, Vince, is because it wasn't just regurgitating what worked against Clemson. Because honestly, Notre Dame could have just regurgitated what worked against Clemson. This is a 4-3 football team that's a very sound, line-up, do-your-job football team that's very well coached. You know, you and I have talked about this before. The defensive coordinator for Boston College, we were told, was one of four guys uh, that were finalists for the Notre Dame defensive coordinator job. Now, he doesn't have Jimmy's and Joe's, but he's a good football coach, right? right. They just don't have dudes. And so uh, I thought that Notre Dame took what BC does and used it against them. And we haven't seen that a lot as much as we want to this year. And I think part of it is, Vince, because for a lot of the season, they were trying to find out who they were yeah. as a football team. And I felt like this was, and we said this Saturday night, this was Tom Maurice's best job of using every. this is who we are and let's use everybody as part of this game plan. And it really started in the run game. And the I think that we set the tempo, Vince, really early in the game. We oh, saw yeah. them use a mixture of run plays, which we'll dive into some specifics. We saw them use a variety of run plays, like I just mentioned, but also out of different looks. I thought they right. really did a great job of using motions and shifts effectively. Uh, they ran inside and outside something we have. We didn't, they, we didn't even really see that a lot against Clemson. I mean, we were just like, there's no way they can keep running duo just over and over and over again. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah. We you can. Know, we well, will. it yeah. worked that game, but you can't just keep going to the right. well every time because teams are going to be more prepared for that. And we've always, one of the things you and I have often complained about is man, you're like, you got to know what the team is going to be doing to stop you and, and exactly. go in with a game plan to beat it. And I thought this was the best job of yes. Tommy Reese anticipating what BC was going to try to do and then go after it. And I think that's a really, really good point and one that I want to stress, right? Because we knew that Boston College was going to be ready for duo, right? Because they actually watched Notre Dame's film. They saw what Notre Dame was good at running the ball, and they lined up to stop it. Smart dude. I mean, that's what you do. I mean, and that's Imagine what that. they did. And, right. and Tommy Reese actually had a game plan to combat the fact that Boston College was going to try to stop duo and they ran counter and they ran inside yeah. zone and they drew, yeah. and, he, and one of the things that Tommy Reese is really, really good at, and he always has been, but I think even he's developing in this sense, he's really good at dressing up what he wants to do to affect the eyes of the defense, whether it's putting guys in motion, whether it's, changing the strength of the formation, you know, whether it, you know, whatever the case may be, he's really good at dressing things up, giving the defense eye candy that's going to mess with their eyes. And he continued to do that in this game. And I think to a, to a degree that not only did it make Boston college question what they were doing, but it also helped it with the run plays that he was calling yeah. as well. So, I mean, and we're going to get into deep, we're right. going to get deeper into I, I, that, but it was good stuff. Yeah. I felt like he's always done a lot of things uh, of the eye candy stuff, but we didn't always see the the play calling used in a way that then took advantage of that. Like we'd see all these motions, but then it's like, but you're right. never actually giving the ball to that guy, so it really doesn't exactly. impact it, right? But yeah. it's it's gotten better and better and better as years gone on, and it was really at a masterful level. And that it's not just that they did it, Vince, but the timing of it. And and I thought that we really mm-hmm. saw the tone get set in the first the first play. The first play of the game was really. Um, I thought just a, a perfect example of, of, of exactly what we're talking about. And I'm going to give you an example here. So this is for the people that, that want to know what play it is. This is the first play of scrim from scrimmage for Notre Dame. 
And so what we see on this particular play is obviously here's the here's the center right here. So you've got your two offensive linemen, and then you've got two tight ends here, right? So you've got Mitchell Evans and Michael Mayer both on the ball. <clears throat> and you've got Jaden Thomas going in motion. So Notre Dame did a couple really interesting things here. So basically he started out, he started the, out on the other one side. One of the different and went this way. Jaden Thomas, Thomas, correct. He went in he motion. Start, yeah. Right. Um, right. We'll get we'll get to that here in a second. But one of the things that Notre Dame has 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 one of the differences between duo and inside zone is duo is often run to the tight end side. Now Notre Dame has done some different things this year, and especially later in the year, like they did a great job against Clemson. We broke down a lot of the film against Clemson of them bringing the tight end from the backside to get play side on duo, or the second tight end to do that. Right inside zone is more of an open side run where you're cutting back to the tight end side, and so. Uh, it's why I like that compliment. We'll get to inside zone here in a little bit. So what happened on this play is, so this linebacker here and this guy here were bumped in. So this linebacker was out here. This linebacker was here. And this linebacker was here before Jaden Thomas's motion. So what Notre Dame did is when they brought Jaden Thomas in motion, this is how they ended up. And this guy actually takes another step before the snap and gets like almost right over the right on the inside sh shoulder of the nose guard. Okay. And this guy, this 42 bumps out. So what they do is they come here. And then what Notre Dame would often do is, is, is they would run duo here and bring him around or bring the tight end around, but they step this way. Right. So it looks like they're running duo here. Right. And so at the snap, so that the snap BC's kind of thinking here. So already Tommy Reese is messing with their eye, their eye placement. And so what Notre Dame did is instead of running duo here, now duo would be double team, double team, a vertical play, a block out. Right. That would basically be duo. You'd see this action right here. Instead, it looks like they're running this way. You have a block down, block down, block back to secure the A gap. And then you've got a gap hinge here. And what they ended up running was counter right here, coming back. And not only did they run counter, but because they're still outnumbered over here, Vince, they brought Jarrett Patterson on a kick, ended up turning into a log because of the way the guy played it. We'll get into Mayer ended up getting up sort of a kick out instead of coming around. But they brought Jaden Thomas here on like a bootleg looking play, which then kept this defender out here. Uh, opened up which allowed Audric Estim or excuse me Logan Diggs to have that extra step. So at the snap you get a really good down block. Blake Fisher steps here and then works up to the linebacker and you've already got a great inside seal on this particular play. So the inside part of the run lane Vince is secured in impressive fashion. Zeke Carell secures the 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 backside A gap so they can't get across and blow this play up, right? So then what happens is, is Jarrett comes around. This defensive end, you can't really see him because there's two guys stacked on top of each other right here, but there's actually a defensive end there. He squeezes down and gets right in Blake Fisher's hip pocket. Why, Vince? Because what we've talked about is what teams are doing to duo is they're just crashing the backside of duo. Right, squeezing Trying to down. blow it up from the backside. Yep. Right. Tommy Reese and Coach Heastan and Coach McCullough know this because they've seen teams try to do it. So then what happens is, is they use it against BC. So because this guy comes down, then Jared Patterson is able to log this guy. And now they're completely sealing off the inside. Because normally on a counterplay Vince, you'll have this guy come here and Jared Patterson will kick him out. And then Michael Mayer will have to kind of get up in here in, in front of that. It's pretty but much what like happens is, is because like this guy's right, right. Right. So this guy squeezes down. So Jarrett's able to lock because what you're taught is if this guy's inside, then you get to work as outside. And then Michael Mayer's got to read that block and get outside. So this guy comes and, and what happens here is this guy blitzes off the edge. Again, teams are trying to crash the backside. This guy goes high, completely takes himself out of the play. Now, what Notre Dame was trying to do was take him out of the play with Jaden Thomas. So if he wouldn't have crashed, he would have had to work outside with Jane Thomas because that because of the bootleg action, right? So he they get the down blocks here. This guy gets logged. Mayer gets around and gets a really nice second level block. And then because of Jaden Thomas here, this safety can't come downhill as hard. So the final thing that teams do against their name is this safety crashes hard, right? When they see run play, that guy crashes hard. 
because of the counter action, he wasn't able to get down as hard, Vince. But also, this action by Jaden Thomas, he has to kind of prepare for that, protect against that. Because he would have to – him or him or him would have to take the bootleg. One of those guys is going to have to handle the bootleg, right? And so it just opens it up, and then this guy kind of comes down on Logan Diggs late, and Logan makes a miss, and then he's off off to the races for a 50-yard run. So well well designed. I loved that it was the first play of the game. It was sending a message to to, to uh, BC on the first play, like, you think you know what we're doing, but we're not. We're not. We got something completely different for you today. And I thought it was a – Vince, you, you as an offensive coordinator – when, you know, you were an offensive coordinator. I've been a pass game coordinator. You always kind of want to come out and, and set the tone early for who we are going to be. And I thought this call was a great tone setter schematically. And then, of course, it, it works because they're not expecting counter, right? Especially this count, this version of counter, they're not expecting it. And I just thought it was really extremely well done and what incredibly well executed as well. That's another big part of it. But uh, uh, BC is a physical downhill team, but this was the first example of many of they could not play downhill because they weren't sure what was being thrown at them. Yeah, you're right. And this was a, hey, we know what you're going to try to do to stop us and we're going to run something different. And so it's like, we know what you're doing. Now you've got to stop what we're going to do. And that is something that we haven't seen up to this point. It was just, hey, we're going to run what we run, and you can try to stop it, and you may be able to stop it, but we're going to do what we do. This was the first example of we know you know what we want to do. And we're going to do something a little bit different to counteract your solution for what we're going to do, right? And that is another step in the evolution of Tommy Reese, in my opinion, right? Because remember, we were talking about in the past, we would talk about, it just seems like the same game plan over and over and over, regardless of who they're playing against, right? And that was a knock. Like, that right. was a legit. We're just going to do what we do. Right, right, absolutely. And guess what? You can generally do that against teams that you're better than, right? You can kind of get away with that. But this shows me now, okay, now they're, they know what they can do. They know what they have in their arsenal, and now they can game plan – for specific teams. And I know that sounds very elementary, but we haven't seen it yet. And this is the first game I thought that we actually saw that. And that was super refreshing. We've seen it inconsistently. Okay. That, that's, that's the thing for me. It's we've seen it inconsistently and, and I, and, and, and it, it can't be, it can't be, mm -hmm. it has to be more consistent in, in my opinion, but, and it was really the whole game because the other criticism of some of, of you can make of coordinators is some coordinators are really good on the script. Once they get off the script, they're not quite as good. And I thought that that's been a criticism lobbied against Coach Reese in the past at times, by us sometimes as well, that I thought was good because I really felt like we saw this extended throughout the entire game. And to me, it shows continued growth of a 30-year-old offensive coordinator. Of just He's going to, you know, hopefully he's going to get keep getting better and better and better. And, and so we saw it early, but we then get into the second quarter and we saw some of this too, Vince. And I'm going to give another example of one of the things that I really liked in this game. And again, notice the first two plays we're about to draw up are both big gains. Neither one of them were duo. So here's what happened on this play. Good point. Pre-snap, both tight ends were over here, right? And so what? And then Lorenzo Styles was out here. He was over there. He was outside. So they line up and they motion the two tight ends over, and then Lorenzo comes on a jet motion, and then stops and spins and goes back this way. Right. So BC is thinking, what, Vince? First of all, look at all this. The ball's about to be snapped. And look at all this. Look at everybody's looking around. You see their eyes? This, I took this uh, clip right before the snap. Lorenzo's going to plant and go this way. Right. So this, look at all, look at the eyes of the BC players. They're thinking, they're talking, they're not. So these guys are both looking this way. And what happens is, is they're thinking duo's coming. Well, duo wasn't coming. And so at the snap, Notre Dame's running inside zone. So they're going to block inside. They're all stepping here, stepping here, stepping here. That's supposed to be the tackle. Michael Mayer is coming backside here to secure the edge. And then Lorenzo Styles is going on a jet motion that way. 
And what they're trying to do, it's another example of they're trying to mess with the eye discipline of the BC team. I believe, and I and I forgot to write this guy down in my notes, but I believe this guy went with Lorenzo. Because what happened, this is how crazy this, this is how screwed up BC was, Vince. Do you know who Blake Fisher is going to, Blake Fisher is going to make an inside zone block out this way. Do you know who he blocks out that way? Based on the pre-snap look, you'd think it would be him, right? Absolutely. It was him. It's the Mike linebacker. <laughs> like normally how inside zone will work is you'll get a double team here and then Blake's going to step inside. And if this nose tackle slants out, then Blake and, and Jer Josh Lug are going to work on a double team up to the Mike backer, right? Or if this guy stays here, then Blake will just kind of work up to the second level and take him, block him down. Mayer's going to come back and get here. And then hopefully Lorenzo can take care of that guy. That's the hope. Well, what happens here is they were so jacked up by Lorenzo going one way and immediately going the other way because they had just got done communicating this way and they go that way. This guy ends up working out here and Blake ends up sealing him outside. And Josh Lug and Zeke Carell destroyed that. Oh, kid. yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and it was all game long, Vince. They just destroyed that kid. My wife took a picture of a block where Joe Alt is blocking number 93, I think, and his back is bent. Like, and you're like, that's when you know you've dominated to do. When you can arch his back, you know you've dominated. And we saw that several times in this game, Vince. But so what happens is, is Audric steps here and you're thinking duo, duo. Duo is usually a play side hitting play, right? But what happens is, is BC's kind of guy step here. This guy's worried about that. So the motion here and the action here by the back has BC. Some guys thinking this way, some guys thinking this way, but nobody's thinking what's actually going to happen, which is Audric Estimate is going to go right here and cut back on inside zone because inside zone is a designed to be a cutback play. Duo is a is normal. I mean, it can cut back. We've seen a cutback, but it's normally designed to be a vertical bounce type of play. Right, Vince? Am I correct on that? It's a vertical insertion that will bounce more than it'll cut back. It can cut back. But because there's hard double vertical double teams, it's a little harder to wind this thing back than inside zone because inside zone, Vince, everybody's in theory stepping play side. So you're going to get a, a slow swipe. The duo is more of a downhill vertical play, right? And so you're not going to get the same lateral motion that you get with inside zone. That's why I love duo and inside zone being complements to each other, not right. one over the other. Right. And when we've seen Coach Reese mix up inside zone and duo like he did against Clemson and like he did against Boston College, this run game is really hard to stop, Vince. Really hard to stop. So they hit this. I mean, and it cuts. And and Logan's like, if he just – he could have maybe tried to make the safety miss, but he thought, nah, I'm going to choose punishment instead. And just ran the guy over. And, and you, you know, you look at it, Vince, and you're thinking, man, like they just – again, this is a this is a well-coached football team – that just didn't have an answer. And, and I'm going to look up, I believe this was low. This was Audric's longest run of the game. I think this one went for 17. Yeah. Yes, it went. No, it went for 12. I thought it went for a little bit longer, but this is a second 10 run that goes for 12 yards. And, and it was an easy 12, an easy 12. And so that's just another example, Vince, of, of the manner in which they really just kept BC on their toes with basic run plays. And it was um, it was fun to watch. It really was. It really was. Well, and that's the thing about the I got a couple other things, Vince. I was just going to no, say, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Keep going, that, that's the thing about complimentary run plays because you run one thing, and then okay, we're ready for it. We're going for it, and then you run something else that's complimentary that looks the same off the off the snap, but it's different, and the the back is taking a different path, and and it's just slightly different, but it's slightly different enough that when you have a really good back and you have a really good offensive line, it's going to make a huge difference in what you're able to gain. And so I can tell you right now that when the next opponent is watching this film, they're going to have to play it more straight up. They're not going to be able to cheat thinking that it's duo or thinking that it's inside zone, because if they do that, they're going to get gashed in a negative way for them in a positive way for Notre Dame. They're going to have to play it more straight up. And that again gives Notre Dame an advantage because they're going to be ready to roll with that, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it just it makes you just that much more tentative now. If you're the next opponent, you have to be ready for both. And you can take a chance, and you can try to cheat thinking it's one thing or the other, but if you do that and you're wrong, 
that <laughs> that's where Notre Dame just eats, right? And so it it's going to be very interesting to see how USC plays their hand defensively against this Notre Dame run game because it's not just one thing over and over and over. And I know you want to talk about the way that they were actually you getting outside too. I don't know if that's where you're headed with this, but you know, a little bit, yeah, another wrinkle, yeah, a little another bit. wrinkle. But no, to yeah. your point though, Vince. I- I think that's a very important part because you can crash it thinking, hey, we're going to guess duo here. And if you guess right, you're going to blow it up. Right. If you guess wrong and they're running counter or inside zone, it's off to the races. Right. And and that's where BC was. BC was – it put BC on their heels combined with right. the pass game, right? And that's where you are talking about earlier. The fact that they came out early and I think threw on, what, three of their first five plays – was like, hey, we're we're gonna throw the ball the way they were using the backs. So we're getting outside. BC was on their heels. Here, here's and and you know we talked about the jets and the motions and all that. BC was on their heels all game, and and they, that doesn't happen in a lot. When they get beat this year, like Clemson did, they got beat by Clemson because Clemson just had better players. But if you look at that game, Vince, early in the game, it wasn't it wasn't a route early in the game. I mean, Clemson pulled away late because they just have better guys. But it wasn't a game where you know you come out and it was like Notre Dame was. I mean, Notre Dame had more points at the end of the first quarter or first half than Clemson had the whole game. The Clemson BC game Vince was 10 to three at halftime and 17 to three at the end of the third quarter. Clemson right. scored twice in the fourth quarter to put that game away. No- Notre Dame had more points after a quarter than Clemson had after three quarters, because again, it was their defense was sound. They were in good position and it had to be about just Clemson being better than them. And Notre Dame is better than them. But Notre Dame was able to pile on them so early because they did some things schematically that BC just had no answers for. And, and their defense helped them out by giving them some short fields. That helped as well. But then Notre Dame Absolutely. capitalized on that. Benjamin Morrison picks off the quarterback. And so what do they do, Vince? They put it into the end zone. And instead of it being 6 nothing because you settled for a field goal, bam, you punch that sucker into the end zone. And now all of a sudden it's 10 to nothing. And I think that was the key to the game. And there was a couple other things that I saw in this game that were like Vince. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over my favorite sequence of the game. Okay. One of the things that I've been critical of of Coach Reese at times in the past is sometimes like something will work and you just don't see it again. Or maybe there's just not a, I see this, go right to it. And and real quick, Vince, I think because I have the uh, the 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 thing worked up sometimes – I'm behind. I'm lacking behind. So I think a little bit you and I are a little off. So just to prepare people, if Vince has a delayed response to something, that's the reason why. And this happens sometimes when we connect the whiteboard to to it. So just so people understand, like, why did Vince just randomly go, yeah, in the middle of Brian talking? Because he's not here and he's a little, he's a little behind. <laughs> so I, why are you yelling at me? So I just want people <laughs> to understand that's what's going on sometimes. So uh, there was a sequence in the first quarter, and I'm let's just draw it up, let's bring it up. So this is Vince. All right, what what do you see here, Vince? What's the what's the first thing that I'm gonna love about this personnel grouping? What are you gonna see here? Now that we got two backs, twenty one is it twenty one three? Oh yeah, there you go. It's I thirty one. That is okay. Yeah, because this is Chris Tyree. Yeah, that's Chris Tyree. Yep, okay. So Notre Dame comes out in 31 personnel. Tyree goes in motion, and they ran a jet sweep. So on this particular play, you've got Mayer, and then you've got Audric Estime, sort of the lead blockers on the jet sweep play. And they come back to it. Now, what happened on this play is BC overplayed it. So the way that BC attacked it is they, they kind of just – like they just flew out, and they ended up getting Notre Dame outnumbered. They had four guys to Notre Dame's three on the outside. Okay, they got us, but that's no, they didn't get them. The very next play, I'm let me let me just pull up my notes here because I want to I want to make sure I check this because I think this. Uh, let me just get this real quick. I want to pull up the uh, play sheet here real fast. Did I just x out of that? That was dumb of me. Give me one second, Vince. I got to pull the the play sheet back up. I don't know why I xed out of that. That was really dumb by me. Yeah, see, this is what happens. Okay, so on this particular play, this is first quarter. This is the going to set up a big play. So I want to get you guys all squared away so you can kind of go look and see the sequence of events because I know some of y'all like to like to look at, at uh, these 10, particular plays. I believe is this if, if I've got yep. this right. Yep. Yep, because the next yeah. play, they gain two yards. The next play is the play to Deion oh. Colsey. Yep. 
Yep, yep, exactly. The throw to Deion Colsey. Yep, got it so right here. So I'm just going to – just trying to – give me one second, everybody. I'm going to pull this thing up here real fast. And where did it go? I'm trying to find the Boston College game. Okay, so Vince, this is this is second. This is the second quarter. Do you have the time of when this play happened on there? I, I don't. I do. For some not, reason, it's no. not pulling up for me. I don't. It's going to be okay. So the defensive series started at ten oh four. They went three and out. So it's probably going to be around eight minutes, maybe seven eight in that neighborhood. Okay. So the fourth play of the drive. So maybe okay. you're at about six. Okay, so let me. Uh, so we ha- here we go. Let me find it here real fast. I'm gonna I'm gonna have it here, Vince. I want to just here we go. Notre Dame Boston College full book. So we are the second quarter. It's the first quarter. We have it is Notre Dame's third series. So the series starts at 8:41. Notre Dame runs to estimate for four yards. You had the little slide pass to Jaden Thomas for nine yards. Then you had the corner route to Mitchell Evans for uh, for that that it gets thrown complete. that's off target. And yeah. incomplete. If he throws it a little bit sooner and gets it out there, maybe Mitchell has a shot. Sure. Mayer was also open, but he actually locked in on Mitchell Evans on that play. So now it's second and ten at their own thirty-two yard line, and Notre Dame goes to this alignment and they run the jet sweep, and BC overplays it. Okay, so third and eight, Notre Dame has to move the chains. It's third and long. So that was the play where Deion, uh, Drew Pine scrambles and he hits Deion Colsey over the top. Okay. Now here's here's what I liked, Vince. Let me let me pull up after the third down conversion. The very next play after the third down conversion, they go back to thirty one personnel. Okay, so they're now back to thirty one. So this is Chris Tyree, and this is the two backs. So they're back to thirty one. Now they're a little bit different look, yeah. and right. in fact they're More actually overplaying look. it. So not only so before yeah before they were in a split bat look right. Now they put Aldrick Estime in an offset, and now Logan Diggs is in an eye, and then they bring Chris Tyree in motion, which is now even overplaying we're going left. BC overplays it, so what do they do? They fake a pitch to the left. Drew Pine drops back, and what they did here, this is the play where I'm trying to remember what uh, Deion Coles, I think he ran a – go route or a post route, I think. I have to go back and look at that. But then Mayer comes on a crossing route, and then Logan Diggs kind of comes out and then goes here and beats this guy up the field. He gets this guy thinking I'm going out and beats him up the field. And this is the play where he steps up and hits it over the top. Drew is patient with it. This was my favorite sequence of events of the game because he saw – it reminded me of 2020 Georgia Tech. When, if you remember that play down there where they ran a, they ran Tyree and Kyron in the game together, they ran a stretch play and Tyree smoked a reverse and Georgia Tech didn't react to it at all. So he just came right back to the reverse on the very next play and went for 20 yards. We, he couldn't go right back to it because they had third and eight to convert. But I love that he saw it and said, okay, they're not, they're overplaying the jet sweep. They, they know when Chris is going to do this. So what have we always said? Man, sometimes use him as a decoy, right? Get him in the game, get him the ball, then use him as a decoy, and that's exactly what they did. Logan goes here. Drew shows great patience and gets the ball out into that open window because because Logan just put a great move on that kid and just beat him up the field. But I love this week sequence of events, Vince, because it was like, okay, you want to do this? I got something for you, but I'm not going to wait till you go to the sideline and get a chance to talk about our 31 personnel and prepare for our 31 personnel. I'm coming right back at you because absolutely. we just moved the chains on th- for third and eight. And I absolutely loved that sequence event. And we saw a lot more of that gamesmanship from Coach Reese in this game that I thought was really, really effective. That's really effective. Yeah, no doubt about it. And it was a responding to what the defense was doing, which was awesome. Like that was that was awesome. And he was like you said, they weren't able to get their coaches in their ear to to correct them and coach them up because I I do think that that's probably what would have happened like hey guys we haven't seen 31 personnel this is how we need to play it right they over pursued again and Notre Dame I mean and Tommy Reese noticed it and they were they had a, a play in the holster but ready to go in case that was that happened right and they were able to come right back to it. Which right. Is fantastic. They were prepared for them if they overplayed it. Right. Correct. Exactly. That's that, the key. Vince. I'm glad you plan. said that. I'm glad yes. you said that. Right. 
you didn't just draw it up in the dirt in one play. You knew right. if they do this, we're coming right back to it. And I, I, I thought it was good. There's a, another little wrinkle that we saw in this game too, Vince, that, that was a little bit different from Notre Dame that I thought was a little bit of a tendency breaker from Notre Dame. And it was a key third down play. And I'm going to pull that up now. And it was actually on that play, Drew Pine made it one of his best throws of the game. We're going to talk about it. And then we're going to talk about later in the game when he tried to go back to it, but shouldn't have. This is a third and I think this is a third and six play. This was in the first quarter. And it was a pass to Michael Mayer. I'm going to find exactly when it was. I believe this was on their third series. It was a pass play to oh no second. Is it their second series or their fourth series? Let me find here real quick. It is the fourth series. It was the very next series after the play that we just looked at. So Notre Dame, it is the second to last play of the second of the first quarter. It is a third and five at the Notre Dame 25-yard yep. line. So late first quarter. So Notre Dame had uh, just ran a pass for Chris Tyree for, to one yard, Audrey, or minus one yard. And then uh, that was the little bootleg where Drew threw it too long and Chris kind of had to reach out and he kind of stumbled and got tackled. The next play, they come back with an inside run. Audrey has to make it six. You're now facing third and five. I believe Notre Dame called a timeout on this play and then came back out. So Notre Dame went with a bunch look to the left. This is what we call a bunch look. They're tight down to the line of scrimmage. Vince, what is Notre Dame? Notre Dame's tendency out of this look is normally to do stuff over the middle, correct? Something like this, crossers. some yeah. kind of high low, right? You know, this guy may go low to kind of get him. They they do a lot of that. Okay. What they did here, however, is they went away from their normal tendency. So this is Mayor here. Okay, that's Michael Mayer. So what happened here is this guy ran a wide go route. So you take the cornerback with him. And then Mayer basically has a a, a, route, a win against one of whoever's going to guard him here. He gets outside and he's running a deep out. And then what they did here is they brought Lorenzo Styles on a really fast cross. So this is the flood concept I was talking about before the game. And that you kind of you get a high, a medium, and a low. And so what it does here is it it pour, it, it forces them into sort of a, a it's a tough situation, right? So this guy has to help out over top. They run one of those guys off, and then Mayer's in, an, in, an, in a one-on-one, -on -one, and he beats his guy, and Drew Pine throws it a second late, but it was an accurate throw. It's about a 15- to 20-yard out cut by the time he threw it. Perfectly thrown ball to move the chains on third and five. But if you're going to go back and watch this play, I want you to watch this play and then watch the next play they're going to draw up, which is basically the same play, right? On this play, Drew Pine gets his drop, and he pretty much stays back, the pressure never gets to him, and he just throws the ball out to Michael Mayer for a great ball, great ball. I mean, this was one of the best balls he's ever thrown. Wins the one-on-one, -on -one and it's moved the chains. Notre Dame ends up going down and, and kicking a field goal on this drive because they go back to this same play on the next third down in this drive. Okay, and I want to break that down to kind of talk about an area where I think Drew Pine has to get better and, and why – when we talk about Drew Pine and people say, well, that's just that's just who he is, I say, no, I don't agree with that because we see the opposite of it at times. And this play is a perfect example of it. So this play made the right read, got the ball out to Mayer, and everything was, you know, hunky-dory, works out great, okay? So then we we see that play again later, Vince, of the, on the same drive. Notre Dame goes back to that same play, okay? And so what happens here and I'm going to I'm going to pull this up here real fast. This is the end of that same play. Now Notre Dame actually gets to this play out of a true trips look, okay? It's the same play for Mayer, right? So what happens here is you have a post, you have a post from this guy, from the outside guy and then a wheel and then Mayer was number 3 and he runs that same outcut, okay? It's the same route. But what happens is, is now look how close Chris Tyree is to the line of scrimmage when he makes, or excuse me, the uh, Drew Pine is to the line of scrimmage when he makes this play. And this is when Drew gets in trouble. People say he gets the ball batted down because he's short. Sometimes maybe, but that's not the problem. It's not the shortness. It's the fact that when he is right and he stays back in the pocket and throws the ball, people don't bat it down. When he gets to his drop, and then creeps back up is when he gets into problems. And this is a perfect example. And on this particular play, he's locked in on Mayer. But Drew Pine does two things wrong on this play. 
Mayer actually comes open, Vince, and he's trying to throw the ball to Mayer. Yeah, but the first right mistake now. he makes, right? The second mistake he makes is that when he gets his depth, he he because he'll get it and he'll gather. But you know, you teach a quarterback, you know, uh, you kind of get back and you're moving your feet, but your feet stay in position. You don't creep up. Drew gets back there and he gets back in the pocket. Then he creeps up as he's as he's going through it. Right? He doesn't keep his depth. And when he keeps his depth, as we saw against Navy and as we saw on the first pass. He's able to get the ball out over the top of the defensive line and get it where it needs to go. This is the same exact route. Why did this one get batted down and that one didn't? Because that one, he threw the ball from back here. On this one, he's throwing the ball from up here. That's allowing the pressure to get right into his face. That was his second mistake. The first mistake is his internal clock was broken on this play. He was going to go to Michael Mayer no matter what. And he waited and waited, and that's when the happy feet come, and he starts creeping up in the line of scrimmage. Sometimes he's just got to know, yo, all these dudes are bailing. Yeah, may or may come open, but I got this 4-3 cat over here that I can just dump this ball off to. Tell me who stops, Chris. It's just third and 10, right, Vince? Here's the line of scrimmage. Here's the marker. This guy's on Mayer. This guy has his back turned to Chris Tyree. This guy's running deep on a post route. Who is going to cover Chris Tyree if you just throw a little quick screen swing pass to him? Who's going to cover him? The answer yeah. is maybe that guy. You know, you know, I mean, somebody coming off the sideline to tackle him, right? But it's not happening. These mm -hmm. are the these are the areas where Drew has to continue to get better. So he has two chances to complete a pass here. He could have thrown the ball to Mayer. And honestly, Vince, if he would have stayed back here, even with the fact that I would have said, I need you to throw that ball to Tyree as his quarterback's coach he still would have hit, completed that pass if he'd have thrown it accurately because Mayer came open, it's just like he did on the play before, same series. But instead, he creeps up, ball gets batted down, and that was that compounded a previous mistake of not getting the ball out to Chris Tyree on the swing. We have seen that a lot from Notre, from Notre Dame in recent games. We saw it against Navy. We saw it against Clemson. We've seen it a lot where uh, the guys out there, we saw against Stanford, running backs are out there with not a soul within 10, 15 yards of them. You only got to check that thing down twice before teams got to start playing you differently. And so that was the that was the first mistake that I thought he made in this play, Vince. And it's just an example of this is not a Drew Pine doesn't have enough talent situation because literally on the same drive on third and five, he hit this exact same pass. It wasn't a physical problem from, from a talent standpoint. It was a get out of your head, stop rushing through things, because when you lock in on Mayer, you tend to kind of panic a little bit, right? Stay back in your drop, let the play develop, and go to it. And that's a, 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 the key. And that's why when we talk about Vince, why we say this isn't a situation where, oh, this is just who Drew is, he doesn't have the ability, he's not good enough, all that other kind of stuff. This is a situation where, Drew's got to start making better decisions. And if he can start making better decisions, then guess what? He's going to have more success. And I think that sequence of events right there was a perfect example of the issue. And I would, I would encourage people to go back and look at the first play, which is late in the first quarter, and then look at the second play, which is early in the third, uh, second quarter, and it's the same drive. And instead of getting a touchdown to go up 24-7, you got to settle for a field goal to make it 20 to seven. That didn't hurt you against Boston College, right? Just like only getting a field goal on your first drive didn't hurt you against Boston College, but it may hurt you against USC. It may hurt you if you get into a big bowl against a, a better opponent. And those are things that Drew has to continue to learn and evolve and get better at. And if he can start making some of those plays and, and you know, keep your technique consistent, that's the biggest thing, Vince, is just a lack of consistency from Drew. The tools are there for him to make all the throws that Tom Maurice called on Saturday. It's just the consistency of his process and the consistency of his technique are the things that keep him from making more of those throws. Now, look, we didn't talk a lot about Drew Pine in the game yesterday, right, in the postgame show. And, and I'll say this. Drew had too many misses in the game, right, for your offense to really be per, you know, sure. really running on full cylinders. You had that play right there. You know, you had a you had a miss on a on a couple plate throws. Or, I mean, or he has – Salerno open. He, he maybe scores on that play. He have Lorenzo Styles open. He waits too long to throw the ball to Lorenzo. And he tries to throw with a glove on. And I don't know where the ball went. 
And because uh, remember, somebody said we we're in the press box. Somebody said, "Where is he trying to throw that? Does he know where he's trying to throw the ball?" Like, no, we know who where he's trying to throw the ball. He just couldn't do it because he's like trying to cup it because he wasn't comfortable yeah. throwing with the glove on. It was, it was yeah. It and was you weird. can see his whole his motion whole got motion jacked up. Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And so these are the things, Vince, where he's got to start hitting just a couple more of these passes. I thought you nailed it when you said like just the way they use the pass game to complement the run the 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 uh, run game with jet sweeps, with the perimeter throws, with the using the running backs out of the backfield, getting Michael Mayer involved, getting Mitchell Evans involved. Hey, look, it was an incomplete pass, but you just set a tone to say, hey, look, we will throw to Mitchell Evans if you don't play it, right? And you went and we didn't hit this one, but you better not bank that we're not going to hit the next one. I thought that was good, and if Drew just could have hit like. Three more passes. The check down to Tyree. You know, he had a play. Uh, I'm trying to remember just a couple more. There's a couple more like crossers that were there. There was the throw to Mitchell Evans, and he hit that a little bit one. earlier. I yeah. think he can hit that corner. Yeah, I thought that was one. Just a couple of those throws, and all of a sudden, teams well, are like, now what do we do? How the yeah. heck do you defend this team now? And that's right. the key. And he and he had Lorenzo Styles on that first drive in the corner of the end zone when he threw it into the ground. I mean. Lorenzo Styles was open. I mean, there, there's no two ways about it. He was open. It was the right read. It's just poor execution because he just couldn't throw with that glove on, which perplexes me a little bit because they practiced outside all week. And so was he practicing with the glove on, or was this a game day decision? Like, I and I, it, it didn't end up mattering because he took it off after the first series, and obviously they won 44 to nothing. So I don't want to harp on that, but it just seemed odd to me that that was the decision that was made. So, but no, I... I agree with you, and I will also say that when you were talking about him climbing the pocket, right? And climbing the pocket is good for some quarterbacks, okay? And because somebody had a question in here about what's the difference between moving up and climbing in the pocket. But in this regard, climbing the pocket is bad for Drew Pine because he is shorter. You want to stay back. It doesn't work as well. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. What was it? It was climbing the pocket. What was the other thing they said, Vince? Climbing the pocket versus what? Moving up? Is that what they asked? Right. Yeah, like because you were talking about him moving up from being in the back. Climbing the – yeah. <laughs> climbing the pocket is in response to uh, the way the defense is attacking you. So for a perfect example, it was Notre Dame's second possession of the 2018 Cotton Bowl, right? It was a play that Ian Book gets sacked and fumbles the ball. That was a play where I said he needs to climb the pocket. The reason he needed to climb the pocket is because the Clemson edge pressures had come really wide. They were trying to come wide. The the inside pressure had kept it. You had the perfect pocket formed, and he needs to step up and throw that post over the top down the field, right? Because that's where the throwing throwing lane had opened up. It was in response to the pressure. What Drew is doing in this instance is he is back. The pocket is set for him, and he's moving up when he needs to stay back and throw from depth because the pressure has not caused him to have to move up. And we've seen in games where he, like, for example, the play to Deion Colsey, he climbed up and then out of the pocket, right? Because Blake Fisher got, guy made a little quick move on Blake Fisher and got around Blake Fisher. Now, Blake did a nice job of recovering and get him, yes. getting a, a hands on the out. guy and not letting him sack Drew. Right. But Blake got beat on the initial step. But so so Drew had to climb the pocket and then get out of the pocket, stayed back, and then got the ball to Deion Colsey over the top. That's climbing the pocket, right? Because the pressure dictated that he step into that's where the throwing lane is opened up for him. Moving up in the pocket when the when the because like a pocket's supposed to look like this, right? And that's what a pocket's supposed, and then the quarterback's back here. And so you're trying to keep the edge pressure here and try to stone the inside pressure and just keep that pocket right here for the quarterback. Well, what's happening is teams are trying to basically – they're not coming real wide on Drew because they know if they go wide on Drew, he's going to step into it. They want to keep him in the pocket because he's getting to the top of his drop and then just shuffling forward for no reason. And that's allowing them to get their hands up, and teams are seeing this. So they're bringing more vertical pressures, and then when Drew climbs up, they're just teaching their kids to get your hands up and bat it down. You're seeing teams right. teach this because right. they watch Notre Dame. And that's why when you looked early against Navy and when you saw the throw that he made on the third and five against uh, Cl- against Boston College, when he sits back in the pocket and stay, keeps his depth, right, then and gets the ball, teams aren't batting it down because he's like seven, eight, like nine yards from the line of scrimmage, 
right? And the pocket is such because they don't Notre Dame doesn't do vertical sets, right? They're more traditional in their in their pocket sets, which is what keeps that nice little arch of a pocket that Drew has. You climb the pocket when the pressure dictates it. And Drew is climbing the pocket when pressure isn't dictating it, which is getting them the pressure in his face. You know, because if my guard is keeping you at three yards and he's stoning you, and I'm sitting at seven, eight yards, you're not bat down this pass unless I'm trying to throw a hard crossing route. The quarterbacks don't get batted down on crossing routes if they know what they're doing because they find the throwing lane and they throw it. Drew is getting deep out cuts batted down. That should never happen to a quarterback. And it's not happening because he's short. It's happening because he's letting the pressure get too close to him unnecessarily. And that's what's happening to him. And we saw that those two plays right there are a perfect example. Same route, same same drive, his pocket mechanic. Now, he took a step up to throw to Mayer, but he kept his depth and then stepped in through. This is him getting his depth and then shuffling up, then throwing. And that's what's getting him into trouble, Vince. Yeah, absolutely agree. And he just needs – he's getting better at it, but again, he needs to continue to improve on that and realize where his success is coming from while he's in the pocket. That's the biggest thing. Exactly. So that's going to do it for the offensive part of the show, Vince. Let's talk about the Notre Dame defense. And I'm going to let you begin by just kind of giving your overall impression of what you thought of yeah. the Notre Dame defense now that you had a chance to dive in the film and, and look at what you saw. So the defense, you know, and you and I both talked about it before the show started. I mean, we, we the defense was good. I mean, they, they pitched a shutout for goodness sakes, right? The, the defense was really good. The issue, not, not the issue, but they weren't quite as good on the back end when we were watching, not the back end, that's not the right way to put it. They weren't as good as when we watched the film after the fact because, you know, there were some things that they did and they weren't quite as crisp, but my overall impression of the defense was, number one, this team is a lot better when J.D. Bertrand is that linebacker. That's a hard fact, right? I just feel like he is a leader. He is somebody who they need to lean on. He keeps things the where they need to be. I mean, he is very impressive to me when he is in there as far as what he means to the team. And I think that is very, very key. So number one, that that is one of the things I noticed. One of the other things I noticed is that Al Golden was bringing some different kinds of pressures this time around than he did in previous games. Now, they didn't always work. And they were kind of confusing at times. And when 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 you and I were talking about this, Brian, I kind of brought up the fact that, you know, maybe he's just giving a little bit of eye candy to the defensive coordinator and the defensive staff at USC. Is like, hey, we could bring this kind of pressure too. And we can bring this kind of pressure too. And it's very clear that Al Golden likes to heat up quarterbacks. He's going to want to bring pressure. He's going to want to do things that are going to keep the quarterback unbalanced. And that's fantastic. That's what you want to see from me personally. I don't let, especially going into next week, you do not want to let the offense dictate to you what you're doing. You can't just sit back and let a good offense, like what they're going to see, you cannot sit back and let them dictate and then you respond. You are going to have to bring the pressure. You're going to have to dictate some of it as much as you possibly can from a defensive standpoint. You're going to have to do that if you want to be successful, right? And so I did like a lot of that. Now, again, it, some of it didn't hit home and some of it didn't, you know, wasn't the best maybe in that situation. But I just felt like he was adding some things to the game plan to give you USC a little bit more to game plan against, which I really liked. Secondary wise, I, you know, I don't know how deep you want me to get into here, but I thought for the third game Go in for a row, it, man, <laughs> what you want to say. The third third game in a row, the the corners played excellent. They played absolutely excellent, not only in coverage, but also in tackling in open space. And they're going to have to have a fourth game in a row if they want to beat this offense that they're going to play because they want to get you in space. They want to do things to you. They want to manipulate you in space because they have better athletes than the vast majority of the teams that they play. I think it's not necessarily the case against Notre Dame. And if they come out and they do what they've done for the past three games, starting at Clemson, because what was Clemson's game plan? Get it outside, get our athletes in space, because Notre Dame can't tackle in space. Well, Notre Dame did. 
They did very well against Navy because where Navy hurt Notre Dame was not on the outside, right? They hurt they hurt Notre Dame up the, up the middle. And then they did a really good job of it this week, uh, you know, against BC. They were open field tackling Zay Flowers. They they tried to get him the ball in space with the now screen, things of that nature. That was so great key tackling. To this game. Great tackling by Cam Hart. Obviously, Benjamin Morrison did a good job. I mean, three interceptions. Clearly, <laughs> clearly, he played a really, really good game. We can talk about him more specifically. But I just thought the outside was, if that's going to be USC's game plan, is get the ball outside. Awesome. I feel very confident about what the corners are able to do. I'm just trying to get a check here, Vince, to see if we're a little bit back, more back on track now that I disconnected. Are we a little bit yes, closer or I, am I still ahead of you? Your audio matches your mouth, at least visually, which was okay. the case before. <laughs> For me. Okay. I still I still think I'm a I think still think I'm a little ahead of you, but we'll 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 figure this okay. out. But I I think the perimeter stuff, Vince, was so key in this game. Yeah. So yes. key in this game. We're actually now back on now because you're actually responding to what I'm saying. So this is a good thing. So um <laughs> okay. uh but uh I thought if you Here's what I thought was my big takeaway from this game. Al Golden has supreme confidence in Mike Mickens and his cornerbacks. Absolutely. Because he basically said, we're going to let you cover Zay Flowers. And there's a couple times they one of the takeaways for me was there were several times Zay Flowers was kind of open, you know, where if you got a Caleb Williams or a CJ Stroud back there, he can throw that ball out and get it out there. Even a couple times when the pressure wasn't there. But two things about it. Number one is the, the coverage was still good enough to where you had to throw a perfect pass to complete it. And once Emmett Moorhead did, and they got a 39 yard gain, yeah, he couldn't right. on other throws. And then a lot of other times, because the pressure was getting to him, even, you know, even the, even the pressures that didn't get home, he was rattled by it. Even when he wasn't exactly. getting hit, he stepped into pressures because he was rattled by what they were saying. Now, my response to that is be Caleb Williams is going to be rattled by that. He's just going to step up and run or throw or do whatever, right? Oh, so you you got to hit home against yes. a better team. And that's absolutely. kind of where I felt like my takeaway was I didn't actually think the defense dominated the way the score looked. Right, a goose egg it, and you yeah. know, like crossed half field or midfield a couple times it felt yeah. like. Yeah, you know? and like once was yeah. really late in the game. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I mean by that is like they weren't like, oh, my gosh, they were just overwhelming Boston College and just playing phenomenal and they – it's just BC really stinks, and Notre Dame had a couple guys play real well, but for the most part, they just played really sound yes. football. Sound and sound. And so it may come across as a bit of an insult, but it's really not because we haven't seen them consistently play sound football for 60 minutes. The only time that BC had any success, there was two plays that I thought BC had success in this game, really had success. One was the great throw, the 39-yard bomb to Zay Flowers. And honestly, no that was just – that sometimes Vince, as a coach, you've got to be willing to do stuff where you say, "This kid could beat us if he makes a great ball," and you just tip your cap and say, "That receiver's really good, and that kid threw a great pass." Right. It happens. Yep, it's going to happen in every game. You I mean, it's, it was it's good coverage. It's good. I mean, right, it's I good mean, coverage. Yeah, you're facing a dude, and of course Notre Dame picks it off. What like the very next play, Benjamin Morrison has even better coverage, and the ball's not perfect, and it gets picked off. Sometimes that's going to happen. The other play was the one thing I didn't like about this game is the one third and eight where they've been heating this kid up all night. And then before the snap, it's very clear that they're dropping. And the kid sat in the pocket comfortably. The back fell down, got up, and still caught the ball on because they ran a screen. They were anticipating Notre Dame blitzing, so they ran like an angle screen. And they thought they were going to throw behind the blitz. But because the blitz didn't come, the blockers were able to kind of get downfield and and make it, there be enough room for the running back because even if he fell down, if they heat that kid up, the kid falls down and and, and the play is not getting done. I didn't understand why they went away from that. To be completely honest with you, and there was another play later that they did a, an all drop. That if there's a more athletic quarterback, like say I don't know Caleb Williams, Caleb Williams, that's a first down. Yeah. So there's some of that stuff. I really this team. This is not a great drop eight team in my opinion. Uh, so. You know, that was part of it, too. But I'll also say this, too, is as you look at it, everybody doing their job. You got to remember they were without one of their best defensive tackles and Jason. Well, excuse me, one of their best defensive tackle, one yeah, of their best defensive say, linemen. Yeah, right, right. They were right. also without their you know best safety in Brandon Joseph Correct. Correct. in the game. So, I mean, you're down two starters and you still held this team to 117 yards of offense 
and zero points. And they, they really only threatened you once and you literally intercepted them the play after they got into the zone where they were threatening you. And that was, that was a big part of it. So it wasn't like a dominant, like, wow, like how they played against Clemson where they just overwhelmed and swarmed Clemson. Wasn't that kind of game. It was a very disciplined, sound, tackle in space, do your job, cover that guy, do this, eat up the gaps. I thought early in the game, we saw them a little bit gap unsound, but BC just wasn't good enough to hurt them. But I thought they cleaned that up by middle of series two. They had kind of cleaned that up and they were they were back to being gap disciplined. But overall, I thought it was just a, a sound, solid game plan. We didn't see anything too exotic from Al Golden. The, and this is the one thing I said, they blitzed a lot, but there wasn't anything too exotic where if you don't hit it, BC burns you. Right, right. And and I, I, I thought he did a – I'll tell you, one of the takeaways, I don't know if you talked about this when I was trying to get the the, the, the situation fixed here with the, the lag – I thought J.D. Bertrand, you mentioned how good he was. He was really good at getting underneath stuff. They like to throw them over the middle a lot. They like to throw crossers. They like to throw ins. They like to throw stuff to tight ends. J.D. did a great job of hunting for those routes. And a couple times just blowing dudes up, right? There was one time where they were running across, and he blew a dude up, the, saw the quarterback scrambling, they came off that, and then tackled the quarterback scrambling right. short of the first down on the third down. Yes. Right? He was on point. And, I mean, he was yeah. on point. And it – it, it almost it almost felt like the defensive uh, outcome of this game was very JD Bertrandish. It was workmanlike. It was solid. It wasn't overly impressive, you know, from a, from a like a, a crazy, you know, playmaking standpoint. If you don't count Benjamin Morrison's three interceptions, but it was just, hey, we're here to do a job. We're going to do it pretty well, and good luck, you know. And that's kind of what the defensive. It's what it felt like to me. You know, they, they, they didn't make any big mistakes. Yeah, they made a few mistakes here and there, but they didn't make any big mistakes. And they played well when they needed to play well. I mean, Boston College had 81 yards of offense in the first half. 81 yards. And they possessed the ball a decent amount of time. 80 pass yards, one rush yard. One. I, I mean, that that's, that's playing pretty solid defense in the first half for Notre Dame. Solid. The interesting thing about that, Vince, you talk about how they, 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 BC ate up, had the clock a decent amount, right? What was it? Was it overall or are you talking about in the first half? Sorry, in the first half. Okay. I mean, it was Part, like 18 right. to 11, but it had the ball for 11 right. minutes and they only had 81 yards. I mean, right. That's... Part of that was because Notre Dame was kind of scoring quick because of the short fields. But to your point, I mean, it was a very inefficient game for Boston College, and it was a forced inefficient game because the holes to get the ball out to were very tight. And and I thought that was a, a, a really key to this game is they knew this kid's going to get the ball out quickly inside. They're going to throw quick to the perimeter, deep, and then over the middle. The deep, they, the deep in the perimeter, they said, look, our guys, our corners are either going to be good enough or they're not. And we're going to trust them that they're going to be good enough. And they were. And then over the middle was, I thought, again, it was a good job of, of getting pressure right up the middle, partly off just guys doing well. And Riley Mills had a couple really nice pressures. Howard Cross had several really nice pressures. I thought Chris Smith had a couple uh, pocket collapses. We saw Gabriel Rubio have one late, you know, in, in the game where he was able to get a, a really nice pressure up the middle. That helped as well because I didn't think the edge pressure was great in this game. Yeah, I mean, it was okay, but it wasn't great. I mean, you had Isaiah had the one sack, Adam Miola had the uh, one sack in the second half, but it wasn't a consistent pressure. Up the middle, they were getting consistent pressure, yeah. and then of course the linebackers doing a great job of hunting for routes, and that's going to be important against USC because yeah, absolutely USC is going to look. USC is going to mesh and high low the the mess out of Notre Dame, man. I Correct. mean, they're just they're going to do that a ton of that. And they're going to try to threaten the linebackers, yep. and they're going to have to they're going to have to handle it right. And so, overall defensively, Vince, I thought it was a sound game. Yeah, it was, it was aggressive, mm -hmm. but not out of control. Sound pressures. Yeah, you know, bringing overloads to a side, but not overloads overall with numbers. You know, and you know, bringing pressures up the middle, bringing pressures off the edge. I thought it was Tariq Bracy that came off the edge last night. I said that in the uh, podcast. The post game show, I said, you know, they brought Tariq Bracy off the edge in the first play. It was not. It was it was twenty six, not twenty eight. Right. So Xavier Watts, he got blasted on that play. Blasted. 
But you know what? That you know what happened the next time he blitzed? Nothing. Because he didn't let it affect them. Some guys will blitz like that, get blown up by a running back, and be like, eh, I'm not coming with the same intensity next time. Not Xavier oh, Watts. Not Xavier he Watts. came with the same exact intensity the next time he blitzed, yeah. and then, then the next time he blitzed, and then the next time he blitzed. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's kind of the, the kind of mentality you want, you know, that short memory that you really need from defensive players. So I was happy with the performance. I mean, they did what they needed to do. They really dominated right. a team that just isn't very good. Right. And and dominate them worse than anybody else has dominated. I mean, that's the thing, too, is you could say, well, BC stinks and their offense stinks. And yeah, their offense stinks. But you know what? I mean, their offense has never been this bad. I mean, I mean they did just beat a top 20 team the week before. Right. They, they've never been shut out all year. Okay. They got three points against West Virginia, you know, Clemson. They got three points against UConn. But, you know, actually, no, sorry, total offense. Here's, but here's the thing in the, the game where they only scored three points against Clemson, they still had 245 yards of offense. Right. And right. the game against Clemson, against UConn, they still had 335 yards of offense. Notre Dame gave up 173 and just really dominated him away. And, and, and I would say, Vince, some of that, I mean, their last couple drives is where they got a lot of their yards. I mean, they had one play in the first half, but if you look at Boston College in the second half, I mean, they had to clock a lot in the second half. I mean, they had, you know, the f- second quarter, they had it for 745, and then the fourth quarter, they had it for 844. So well, they, they had the they ball had longer. 18 yeah. minutes in the second half yeah. total, Notre Dame's 12, and right. but they only averaged 2.9 yards a play. Exactly. Because exactly. Notre Dame was still steady. I mean, they – they, they were able to run 32 total plays in the second half to Notre Dame's 22, but they only averaged 2.9 yards of play. I mean – And they had what – so, let's see, uh, let's see, third quarter they had 48 yards in the third quarter. In the fourth quarter they had 44 yards. That can't be right. They had 48 no, yards that's right. in the third yeah. quarter and they yeah, had that's 44 right. in the second. Yeah, right, the that's fourth, right. I mean. Yeah, yeah. 117 yeah, passing yards is what they had. I said earlier that 117 oh. yards total yards. 117 passing yards is what they had. Yes. 173 total yards. Right. And that's a strong – and, again, that, that, the passing part of it, that's the thing that's really interesting because they did that to a team that is known for throwing football. I mean, right. before exactly. the game, I had to hear everyone, oh, you know, him and Moorhead so much better than Phil Dracovic, and look at what he's done the last two games. And he threw for 330 yards against Duke, and he threw for 330 yards against NC State, and – you know, he's 80%. this and he's that. And threw for, yeah. 80. I mean, he I mean, threw for 117 the entire game, and 39 right. of that came on one pass. You know, so uh, it right. was a it was a good performance. I was yeah. very pleased. Anytime very pleased you can hold that. a team to yeah. three yards of play, uh, you're doing pretty good. So it's just nice to be in situations, Vince, where you can say our dudes are just better than your dudes, and there's not a darn thing you can do about it. We right. felt that in the perimeter, I mean in the in the box for years. For sure. We haven't often felt that on the perimeter. Not especially as, not on both sides. Not, not on both since 2018. Sides, you know, not since 2018. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and even now then, it's just I feel like more confident now than I even did back then. I, I, me, I'm talking for me. Yeah. I do. I feel more confident now. Well, talk I'll say that about days. playing man and man coverage. They well, look. If they have a bad game against USC, it doesn't dis- it doesn't discount what they did against Ohio State and North Carolina and Boston College and sure. You know what I mean? Everybody has bad days. Right. But. And to play man, you're right, because that team didn't play man a ton. Troy Pride was really the only guy yes. that played a lot of man on that team. Julian and, Lowe was Julian not Love is, a man guy. He's a, he's a zone guy. I mean, he he's always tremendous has at it, right? We talked about that. I mean, he's, he's very prosperous career in the NFL, right? I mean, he, yeah. he's he, he's making money playing playing zone. So, yep, you know. Yep. So uh, before we move on to the young guys, Vince, I do want to remind people, this isn't a Q, This isn't one of the shows where we do a Q&A afterwards. We'll answer some super chats, and we have a few of those afterwards. But we're not going to um, we're not going to be getting to uh, the the Q and A parts, right? So we'll get to that. If you guys have some questions you want to ask about the roster and things like that, we'll talk about that tomorrow. I, I will make one comment about Steve Angeli because I did get some clarity on that. We'll talk about that tonight oh, nice. because tomorrow we're going to move on. Uh, but I did want to just make sure people know there's a lot of questions in there. We're not doing a Q and A today. That'll be tomorrow at one o'clock or one o'clock show tomorrow. And then, we'll, of course, we'll have the 6 o'clock show, the Ivy Nation Sports Talk show tomorrow at 1. And uh, then Tuesday, we'll have just two shows. We'll have the 1 o'clock show, the normal 1 o'clock show. And then the only PM show we're going to do is going to be for the playoff College thing. football playoff, yeah. Yep, so we'll do that one as well. So, Vince, any last thoughts about the defense before we answer these uh, these super chats? Did you you wanted to talk about Angeli? Or you I'm going to get to that when we get to the okay. super chat part. We're going to wrap up no, the I, defensive part now. Look. 
how can you not be happy after a 44 to nothing win? I mean, it was, it was dominating. It was great to see. It was, I think a real step in the right direction for this program. And we talked about that a lot, you know, during the post game show, but even when you go back and you look at it on film, I, I see the evolution of the offense. I can see it with my own two eyes and that makes me very happy. And the defense continues to play well. I mean, they're going to have to continue to play well, obviously moving forward, but they played, they played well. I mean, it is difficult to shut teams out at the division one level. And it was two division one teams playing against each other. It's that's a difficult mm-hmm. thing to do. Okay. And so you have to give credit where credit is due. We can nitpick and we can find things that they didn't do well. And the coaches are doing the same thing. I mean, that's that happens in every game. Just Absolutely. so people understand that happens in every game. Yes, this is, but that's what this, game. that's what this type of show is about. It's to point Absolutely. those things out and Correct. point out what did well point out, because here's the reason it's important because the other team that you play next week is going to look at that and say, Hey, if this quarterback does this, this, or this, this stuff is open. So let's make sure that we're thinking of ways we can attack that. And Absolutely. that's why we try to point that stuff out. And that's what the coaches do when they're in their meetings. That's what exactly. Al Golden is looking at. Hey, you know, I'm glad they don't have Kayla Williams, a quarterback, because there's a couple of those crossing drag routes. He might've been able to hit, you know, for 15, 20 yard gains and really get the chains moving. And then you figure, okay, well, why, why, what, what can we do it to, to handle that? And that's what these shows are about. So absolutely. Just so people so understand. Good what I mean, things are going Things that went about as well as they could possibly go in that game in preparation for the next game, right? You closed out your senior season at home, you know, all of those different things. They they have a great launching point into this week. And now they got to focus on the specifics of this opponent. And it's going to be a lot of fun to pay attention to. So uh, looking forward to this week's shows, because we got a lot of fun stuff coming at you guys. I'm I'm pretty fired up. This is this is the rivalry game, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Okay, we talked about rivalry games. This is the one, and I'm pretty fired up for it. So, Yep. So, Vince, that's going to do it for this portion of the show, and I just realized we had that uh, on the entire time, uh, the wrong thing on there. So that's my bad. Should have had that on there. We had oh, I, I Sports Talk on there. Oh, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> so I just realized that. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, uh, that'll be tomorrow. Vince is jumping the gun a little bit on IB yeah. Nation Sports Talk. Uh, yeah. But before we move on to just these last couple of questions, I do want to ask people: do us a please, do us a solid, hit that like button, everybody, subscribe yeah. to this channel, and uh, share, and hit the notification bell so you don't ever miss one of our shows. Share this podcast not just with your friends and telling people, but hit that share button and let your you know, people that you know uh, get a piece of that. You can put it on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, and just let people know about what we're doing. Sign up for the boards at boards.irishbreakdown.com. And, of course, check out our website at irishbreakdown.com. So we do have some super chats here, Vince, I want to get to. And uh, some of them are, uh, you know, very – we appreciate those, all of them very, very much. But let's get back up to those here, Vince. We have one from Joe Papiti. Uh, Joe says, great dominating win. This is the team we've been waiting for all year. The Freeman mindset is finally sinking in. I can't only imagine – what this team will be with a legit QB bring on USC. I mean, we have seen, here's what you have to be careful of as a fan. When your team has a great performance and you just automatically assume this is, we've arrived, you know, this is who we are. I think the reason there's so much more confidence about this game, Vince is twofold. And I want to tell, I'm going to say this on what you tell me if you agree or disagree or nuance it, whatever you want to do with it. Okay. It's that we have we have been building to this because we did see it against Carolina to a degree. They just didn't finish. We saw it against BYU to a degree. They just didn't finish. Then we saw it against UNLV to a degree. They just didn't finish. And then we saw it against Clemson. And then we're against Navy. We're back to where it was. You show the flashes of the dominance, but then you couldn't finish. And I think coming out in this game, and I wrote about this in my in my key takeaways for the offense was the way the offense came out and just buried Nate, buried BC was important to me to see because it told me that they're like they didn't let that funk from the second half of last week get to them. And if anything, if you watch the offensive line play, it's almost they. I even said this to somebody tonight. So it looked to me like they were playing like they were really ticked off about how the run game worked last week. Yeah. Like they yeah. were mad and they were going to take yeah. it out on BC because they were b- destroying. Mean, BC's have got some good sized physical kids. They were blowing them off the ball. I mean, just completely straight blowing them off the ball. I yeah. mean, just like, they, I mean, Vince, just like you said, collapsing sides of the line. Mm-hmm. We haven't really seen that this year, you know? And, you know, that's kind of, 
that's kind of the you know that's kind of the thing that you you like to see is like they responded with that attitude that that mindset of hey we're a little ticked off you know and and we don't we don't want to we're not gonna let that happen again and then to come out in the second half you finally get the ball after they had two possessions because of the the muffed punt in your first drive you just run it right down their throat and put it in the end zone and say ball game right and it's like okay yeah they've taken that step so to me what I what has I think has so many people excited about it is it's not that the 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 oh they finally arrived in a week in game eleven, it's that we've been building to this and we've now finally seen it enough to where you say okay yeah this is who they are they just got to clean up some other stuff that was my that was one of my big takeaways yeah. from it that Joe and and I think that's you know along the lines of what Joe's thinking as well. Well, and I think you know not only is the the, the Freeman mindset finally sinking in, I think the Freeman as a head coach is starting to sink in. You know what I mean? And and I'm talking from Freeman's standpoint. I think he's finally feeling confident and on steady ground with where he is. Now, that doesn't mean that he's not going to continue to evolve and get better as, as time goes on and all of that. But I think we're finally seeing a consistent head coach of this team. And I think that's huge because the team is only going to be as good as their leader. And they're going to follow their leader, Okay. And you're starting to see that his his attitude is now permeating through the team. They are following his leadership because I think he is now a leader he, of the entire program. The great job as a defensive coordinator when you're a leader of half the team. Great job. That's not being a head coach. There's a lot more that goes into that. And so I think we're finally seeing him be comfortable in his own head coaching skin. And I think that's huge. I think that's absolutely huge. And people don't, I think, give that enough credit if I'm being honest. Uh, so that that's exciting for me to see. And I think we definitely saw that in this game because against Navy, they started out fast. They did great. They were ready to play that game. And then they obviously took a step back in the second half. They were ready to play this game against BC. They, they dominated the first half. And like you said, as soon as they got the ball offensively, man, they, they put no doubt like, Hey, <laughs> interception, give the ball back to our offense. Offense goes down and scores. In one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plays, boom, 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 boom. Just in case you thought you might be coming back, that's not happening. So I, I it was just, it was good to see from a foundational program standpoint, this team is is rising. They they are where they need to be at this point. Let's see if they can continue doing it. I know. Next super chat is from Brand. Actually, no, I want to get to this question here from DC Irish. This is the one I wanted to talk about. I uh, wonder why they didn't play Angeli at all in the second half. So I was told this summer and, and by a couple people, and I should have done more work on it to find out for sure, that uh, that bowl games, because of the transfer rule, that the bowl games now were not going to count as one of the four. And I don't think they should, uh, especially since so many kids are now transferring out and going to the portal before the bowl game. So many kids are opting out that you shouldn't count it as one of the four, but it does still count as one of the four. So Steve Angeli's played in two games so far. He played against UNLV and he played against Syracuse. Yep. yep. And so if he would have played Saturday and let's say something happened to, to Drew Pine against USC and they had to go to Steve Angeli against USC and Drew Pine's out, if you look at the bowl game, they have one of two options play Angeli and burn his red shirt and try to get it back next year. Or right, right. you play Ron Paulus the third. And I don't think they wanted to put him in that situation. Yeah. So, cause he's the backup quarterback. If something happens to Drew Pine, they've got to go with him. It's not ideal, but that's why they are because they did force him into the game against Syracuse. Right. This is, this is where they are, where they are. Right, and I think that was a decision I, I didn't quite understand. I mean, I, you know, Coach Freeman made a choice. He made a call, and you know, it yeah. is what it is. But that's why they weren't able to play him. Right, and and you know, if something if something happened to Drew Pine in this game, of course, Steve Angeli is coming in. But sure. it got to the point in that game where they only had what three possessions in the entire second half anyway. Yeah. Well, they weren't right? going to play him if they had seven possessions. No, no, no. I know, half. but yeah. like it, the way it even worked, made it out, easier. It was like you know, we got three possessions. It's not even worth, you know, it's a snowstorm. You're handing off anyway. You're not going to gain anything. We want to hold his, his red shirt. Nothing happened to Drew. He could go in and hand off during right. this, these last couple possessions. There it is. And 
Now you've got him. Now you've got you're guaranteeing him a red shirt for this year. And who knows, man? None of us have a crystal ball, but that may be important down the road. You don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. we'll see. So if you can do it, you want to make sure that you have that opportunity. Yep. Here we go. Next one from Brandon. Brandon, this is big, man. I really, really, really appreciate this very much. Awesome. This is awesome. Uh, Brandon says, I listen a lot and don't contribute enough for time spent listening, making up for it. And I appreciate that very, very much. <laughs> listening to Ben Ben Morrison's post game, he reminds me of Tebow with his words, his personality. Is he known to be a vocal leader? Uh, he could help lead a, a great backfield in the future and be a good example on and off the field. Nice. So from what I've been told, and again, thank you for the super chat, uh, Brandon. What I've been oh. told is Benjamin's kind of a quiet kid, not shy, but just quiet. He doesn't have the Tebow personality from the standpoint of Tebow was an intense dude, a very, very intense dude. Benjamin's more of a, you know, he'll talk trash, but it's kind of like, you know, low key. And he's from what I've been told, he's a pretty quiet kid. I think leadership comes in form different forms as we, as you know, Brandon, and as we've talked about in this show, some guys are leaders because they're in your face. They're the rah rahs. That's the Tim Tebow's, the Manti Teo's, you know, guys like that. Other guys are more vocal leaders by just how they go back their work every day. The Quentin Nelsons, the Zach Martins, you know, who are not going to constantly get in face guys' face, talk a lot of trash, be the look at me, look at me. And there's nothing wrong with being the look at me guy. I mean, somebody has to be that face of your program. I mean, you, there's a need for that type of thing. I'm not talking like a selfish TO type of thing, you know, but more of like just the out, outgoing, loud, vocal guy. You know, I've mentioned this before on the show, talking to Alex Bars one time in an interview, and he's talking about, you know, Q wasn't just a leader because he would say what needed to be said and he would get on guys when the guys need to be get on. Trust me, Quentin Nelson wasn't just sit back and be a quiet kind of guy. But the greatest leadership that they said Quentin never showed was just by what he did. Yeah. He was going to work his butt off. He was going to, it was a Tuesday practice leading up for this game against some nobody team. And you were, Q was bringing it. And I mean, you, that meant you had to bring it because he was setting the agenda and you knew. That if you are slacking and not getting on it, you don't have to worry about how Coach Eastan. You had to worry about Q first, then Coach Eastan. And he's like, you know, because if if that dude's bringing it, well, you know, you need to bring it. And I think those are some of those ways. And I think Benjamin Morrison is going to be more of that type of player, where how, you know he's the leadership by he's he's working his butt off in the weight yeah. room. He's at he's in, he's always going to class. He's getting good grades. He's doing the work. He's in the community, and then he goes out and dominates on Saturday. And there's a need because you can't have 85 vocal guys, right? right that doesn't work. That, yeah. Right. And you can't have 85 guys that just do, you know, lead by example. You need that nice blend. Need them all. Absolutely. Right. That's right. Yeah. And so um, I think that's the kind of leader we're going to see Brandon Morrison eventually become. Right now, I'm not worried about him being a leader. Just go play ball. You got, you've got enough. You've got DJ man. Brown, go, Houston go Griffith. Yeah, you, yeah. you got Houston Griffith back there. You got DJ Brown. You got Brandon Joseph. You've got Tariq yeah. Bracey. You've got Cam Hard. You've got Clarence Lewis. You got enough dudes that have the experience. Yeah. You have one job dominate, play your game, focus on you, and do your job. And that's going to be the key for him. Absolutely. It's going to be to sit back and enjoy Absolutely. it. And it's like we were talking. I remember we had kind of this conversation, a similar conversation about Michael Mayer two years ago. It's like, hey, just sit back and enjoy it because you're probably only going to get three years of it and it's going to be worth every second of your time. So just like you said, get your popcorn ready and enjoy the Benjamin Morrison show because it's going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Next super chat from John Monty. I saw that. Too. Thank you, John, for the super chat. Appreciate you. I saw that too. He never looks to the run. Talking about Drew Pine never looks at the running back coming out of the flat. It drives me nuts. He just doesn't look that way. You guys rock. Go Irish. Appreciate you, John. And hopefully – he starts, you know, um, hopefully he starts. That's going to, I mean, look, it, now's no, no, no better time than now, right? Maybe he can steal 20, 30 yards against USC because you take a couple check downs because they're right. just not going to defend it. Most Why teams don't they? defend that route that way. They'll, they'll defend it by having the hook curl guy, the you know, hook curl, and then, you know, come downhill if they throw the swing. Most teams don't just run with a swing route because then that's fine. Yeah, run downhill the swing and watch me run curl flat at you all game long. You know what I mean? And, you know, that's what we'll do. I mean, I'm going to run curl option swing all game long and say have fun trying to defend it if you're going to fly a guy downhill to take away my swing route, you know, from a, ba- a check down swing route. But, yeah, you've got to hit that a couple times. You've got to make people respect that. Or if they don't respect you, just keep going to it. I mean, we saw right. Jack Cohn do this against uh, Oklahoma State last year, like early. 
Remember, like he just was like nobody's open. He just threw a little swing pass to Chris Tyree, and he ran like twenty five yards, like just like that, nothing, because there was nobody yep. there. He just took right. it and went with it. And I think that's going to be a big key as well. And then the last super chat from David Reeb. Thank you, David, very very much. Thanks for all you all your your guys' hard work and for the barbecue at the Clemson tailgate. Go Irish. So well, that is more for my mom. That's She's the one that's straight at Mama way. Driscoll. Yeah, that's right. I just show up and eat and talk, and I'm good at those two things. So she does <laughs> yeah. all the hard work. She does all the hard work, and, uh, and I appreciate you coming by and appreciate the kind words, and I'm glad that uh, glad we're able to meet and have some fun. So we'll have hopefully more of those next year. We'll have to see. It's just they're they're a little bit more challenging to put together than, than I think maybe some people realize when you consider all the other things <laughs> we have going on. I know, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're we'll see how it goes. But anyway, now that's the end of the Boston College breakdown. So you know what that means, Vince. It's now officially. When we hit end of this show, it's officially right. Southern Cow Week. I can't so, wait. Yep. Cannot wait. Absolutely. It's the best week of the year. And this is the true rivalry. You can, you can, there's a lot of fake rivalries out there. There's a lot of trophies out there. Whatever, man. This is the rivalry. This is the one yeah. that I get fired and, up. And, and there is a trophy involved, wait. but I can't there tell you what it is because I've never cared the, enough to know. I think it's the trophy. It, it doesn't matter. That means it doesn't matter to me. All that matters is beating Southern Cow. Right. Like that's enough, you know, like enough, I don't even care about the trophy. You know, it's about you got to beat Southern Cal. And that's what I grew up on is is just great. I mean, when I was coming into being a Notre Dame fan, it was late 80s, early 90s, where, you know, those are always big games. I mean, it, you know, I mean, my first I've talked about this before, Vince, you know this, but my first season of really remembering Notre Dame was the 88 season. I was 10 years old. Well, Notre Dame plays USC at the end of the season out in LA, and it's number one versus number two. That was my first experience of Notre Dame versus USC was number one versus number two. Now, obviously, in Notre Dame, a game Notre Dame won. The next year, Notre Dame's number one and USC's number nine. If you remember that, that was the Todd Mar no Todd Marinovich's game. Rodney Pete was the quarterback in '88, and that was Todd Marinovich's freshman year, and a game where Notre Dame turned it over a bunch and still won the game against number nine USC. No, 1990, they go back out there. Notre Dame's number seven. USC's number 18. Notre Dame wins 10 to 6. 1991, uh, Notre Dame is number five. USC was oh, is not ranked that year. 1992, Notre Dame is number five at USC, who's number 19. If you remember, that's a game where Reggie Brooks went off against USC. And then, of course, 1993, Notre Dame was number two. USC was not ranked that year. Uh, they weren't that great that year under John Robinson, or, you know. But hey, Notre Dame got it done, and that was an era of dominance from from Coach Holtz. They tied the next year. Notre Dame was unranked in 1994, but USC was 17, and they tied 1995. Notre Dame was number 17. USC was number five. Notre Dame won 38 to 10. Kind of similar to what we're seeing now. When you say events like 17, Notre Dame. I like it. I take five, that USC. one. I take it. Right. And then, uh, of course, 96, Notre Dame was number 10. USC was unranked. That was the first time Lou Holt, first and only time Lou Holtz ever lost to USC was his last season. And then that began a stretch of games where USC and Notre Dame went back and forth a little bit. But it really was kind of what it, it really kicked off USC's dominance over Notre Dame. Like, you know, Notre Dame won again in 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 99 uh, at home, they went out to USC in, in 2000, if you remember that game, and, and really smacked USC pretty good. And then uh, after that, uh, you had one more win in, in 2001, and then Ty shows up in 02. That also happened to be the 01 game. Also, if you remember, Vince, uh, do you remember what the 01 season was? That was the beginning of the Pete Carroll at Dynasty. Oh, Bob yeah. Davey beat him that first year. So Bob Davey was 1-0 and against Pete Carroll. The next year, Ty Willingham gets in his first year, and uh, USC kind of took off and won eight straight games. And then Brian Kelly broke that streak in 2010. And now Notre Dame's kind of – it was a little back and forth early on in Kelly's tenure. Notre Dame has dominated that stretch here in recent seasons, but obviously USC is a much better football team now than they were then. Uh, in my, and much more talented team then. And, and I'm not a huge Lincoln Riley guy. I think he's a little bit overrated as a head coach, but he's a very good, great offensive mind, and he's way better than – Clay Hilton. There's no doubt about that. So this is going to be a, a fun, sure a fun week. I'm sure every USC fan would agree with us. SB with a super chat before we get out of here. He says, uh, from feeling as bad since uh, Ty Willingham th through halftime of Cal to feeling like the ship was righted to the debacle that was Stanford to raging enthusiasm about next Saturday Notre Dame is making me a manic. Hey, I look, that. I get it. But, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? 
that's what's so great about this game, right? It's just the emotion of it. But I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that I, I don't know if I felt like the ship was righted against BYU because you could still see some of the, you could still see like, yeah, this team can really finish. But I, I have to say that the the the, U, the Stanford loss to me, Vince, was as, as dejected as I had been in a very long time, very long time watching Notre Dame play. And and even like you know, because like Miami in, in 2017 was a really bad loss, and Michigan in oh, 2019 yeah. was a pitiful loss. And but at least you kind of felt like those were good teams. But just it was just the weirdest game to sit up to. Like I don't know what's happening right now. Like I don't understand. Is it the fourth quarter already? Like, what is happening right now? It was the most bizarre game, bad team. And to see that team rebound the way they did where two weeks later, they are curb stomping the number five team in the country. I don't know if I've seen that before, you know? And you were talking about the greatest thing that I can say about Marcus Freeman is when things got the lowest, whatever he did, it worked. Because this is what Notre Dame has exactly. done since then: forty-one to twenty-four win, forty-one to twenty-four win, thirty-five to fourteen win, thirty-five to thirty-two win, forty-four to nothing win. If I and if I'm reading Notre Dame's tweet correctly, I'm going to actually pull that up so I don't get it wrong, Vince. Because I thought this was a a, a a wild tweet. So let me just pull this up, and uh, it's from it was from the Notre Dame PR. Tweet. So let me let me just make sure I get this correct, Vince. They tweeted this out after the game, and it was about here it is. At 44 points, Notre Dame reaches 35 points for the fifth consecutive game, the first time the Irish have achieved that feat since 1943. Wow. Notre Dame has never scored 35 or more points in six consecutive games. So I want to point out something about that 1943 era being the the deal, right? 1943 happened to be uh, an, inter an interesting time for Notre Dame because it was right before World War I. Notre Dame went 9-1 and one that year. It was actually a year that Notre Dame won the national championship. And then, of course, the interesting thing is the next two years, Notre Dame, uh, Frank Leahy left and uh, wasn't at Notre Dame the next two years because of the war. Notre Dame went 8-2 and two and 7-2 and two the next two years. And then when Frank Leahy returned in 1946 – it began a stretch of the greatest stretch of football in Notre Dame history from 1946 to 1949. You want to, you want to hear this Vince? This is an absolutely insane, insane statistic to me. So from 1946 beginning in 46 to 1949, Notre Dame went 36, zero and two. They had a recruiting class that never lost a college football game. 36, it went 8-0 and 1, won a title in 46, 9-0 and 0 in 47, won a title, 9-0 and 1 in 1948 and, won a, and finished number two, and then went 10-0 in 1949 and won a national championship. The only, the in, the, the, in 1948, the, the blemish, the thing that kept them from a, a title was a tie at the end of the season to USC. And that's what makes this rivalry so great. The, both of these teams had a great deal of, of football success in their history events. But both teams would have a lot more success if they didn't play each other. Notre Dame would have – Arab Parsege would have at least one or two national champ, more championships if it wasn't for USC. USC would have some national championships if it wasn't for Notre Dame. And I think that's the thing that makes this a great rivalry is that – it's two programs steeped in great tradition that are polar opposites that for so many part from so much of our lives, these games meant something. And I'm going to be honest. I, I will always want Notre Dame to beat USC. USC is the one rival I don't root against because I want them to be good when they play Notre Dame, because that's what makes this rivalry great. It's like we're Michigan. I want Michigan to be Oh, and whatever when Notre Dame plays them, I want them to lose every single game. What makes this rivalry great is when both of these teams are exactly what they are right now, which is two really darn good football teams. And we've only seen that once in the last 10 years, and that was 2017. My hope is that this weekend looks a lot like that 2017 game <laughs> in Notre Dame's favor, but we'll, uh, we'll have to see about that. We'll have to see about that. So anyway, Vince, that's going to do it for this show. 
Uh, that's Vince D'Addario, everybody, my guy, my football analyst. I'm Brian Driscoll. Vince just had his first undefeated pick uh of the year. Vince went 4-0 this weekend because he picked uh, – he was the only person of all the IB crew people that picked Oklahoma to beat Oklahoma State. And then Vince and I also both picked Oregon to win, and, of course, everyone on staff picked Notre Dame and USC to win. So Vince, 4-0. So you uh, gained a little bit on Ryan. Gained a little bit. Charging hard. Charging hard. Yeah, I think you actually tied him for second because he went two yeah. and two. He picked Oklahoma yes. State and Utah. We're so coming down you to it too. You're tied for second. Yeah, Woo! tied for second. And you gained the game on me because I went three and one. I picked uh, Oklahoma State. So you gained the game on me as well. So well done, my friend. Well done. So every dog. Thanks finds everybody for being with us. Like, subscribe, notifications, bell, bet board at boards.irspectdown.com. Five star reviews. We'd appreciate it. And more importantly, stay safe. Have a great night. And we'll see you again soon on the Irish Breakdown Podcast.